Are you sick of this world? Tired of having to work every week? Tired of having to pay for everything? Tired of having to scrimp and save when some people have everything they could possibly want? Are you sick of hearing people died of preventable causes? Are you done with prisons and borders and police? Well, you've come to the right place. Because so are we. We're tired of compromising, listening to experts, and being afraid of authority. Sometimes it's time to create, sometimes it's time to destroy. But the passion for destruction is a creative passion, too. Abolitionists of all kinds desire a new world with new values and institutions. We will imagine and create that world while tearing down the old, oppressive one. However, those hard at work building the new world in the shell of the old might find the old world will not go away without a fight. We should bring the fight to them. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Before we set everything alight, though, the answer to last week's quiz was yes. That answer again, yes. Thanks to all of you for sending in your essays. In my videos, I speak a lot about how systems of power work and what their effects are. If you've seen any of my videos, you'll know I oppose the very existence of those systems. Systems of power in our, in our time, a kind of nexus of government, media, and corporate power, can't be designed to serve us. They exist to serve rich and powerful people at our expense. That's why they're not broken. They're working how they're intended to. If you want to know more, click on any of my videos, maybe this one. We could continue to muddle along, doing whatever authority tells us to do, or we could tear it all down and be free. People might think they're opposed to destruction, to the whole idea, but they need to destroy nature to live in their homes and buy stuff. Destroying things is bad? Then why do landowners do it every day? They tear down the old and obsolete and replace it with something that works better for them. They don't just keep building levels on something that doesn't work like a game of Jenga. They demolish what no longer works for them, and nobody bats an eye. We should do the same. We just shouldn't worry about things like ownership and laws. Those will just get in the way of necessary demolition. But to destroy an entire political economic system? Is it really necessary? Yes. Sorry. It's the system itself that prevents us from being free, that kills millions every year, and is fueling the most rapid mass extinction since the dinosaurs. And whatever we could do about it if we had time, this system is also designed to prevent us from having any life outside of going to work and filling out forms. We could, say, restore old growth forests, except we can't because of the state. We could take unused or public buildings and turn them into homes for homeless people, but we can't because property rights trump human life. What's that? You don't want a coal mine built on top of your local forest? We'll have to beat you and throw you in cages, then. Every social problem you can name leads back to someone making money off it and the state stopping you from doing anything about it. As such, anything you attempt to create or preserve without at least keeping oppressive forces at bay can be eliminated. You can join or start an organization, and maybe you should, but if it's deemed subversive, even if it's just feeding the homeless or handing out flyers, you can be punished. You can start a commune or a town somewhere, again, could be useful, but some state already claims jurisdiction over that land, so someone will use the state to evict you if they feel like it. If you want what most of us want, though, to make things better, to preserve nature and protect people from climate change, to free people from work, prison, surveillance, and a dreary existence we try to fill with drugs and purchases, it is this system of force that's standing in your way. It can't be changed or guided or reasoned with. 
We should be challenging its existence, intellectually and in the streets. It bears repeating, this system cannot be reformed. It's run by powerful people for their own benefit. So any reform means they lose power, or else that it was a toothless reform. Some people spend their whole lives pushing for the election of certain people or the passing of certain legislation, and what do they have to show for it? Maybe forgiving a tiny percentage of student loan debt or the slight decriminalization of cannabis. And politicians will still take credit for decades of your activism. We could do so much more with all that effort. The political system is not your friend. It's not redeemable, whatever you learned in school. It's not one day magically going to start living up to the values it preaches. It should be destroyed. First, however, you need to destroy your old beliefs. Start with your beliefs about this system. They all come from the system itself, i.e. from propaganda. You need to assume you know nothing if you're beginning your education. Unlearning old beliefs is the whole purpose of this channel, so again, if you're looking for resources, watch my videos. If you're getting sick of me, let me know and I'll link you to other people that you can learn from. I get it. Just like we shouldn't wait around and expect politicians to do the right thing, we shouldn't wait around for the rest of the people to catch up to us and give us their approval. Most people are not prepared to fundamentally question these institutions, let alone set them on fire. But if you show results, some of them will join you. Once your old beliefs are out of the way, you can begin to analyze your situation, and what you do will flow logically from that. Some radicals envision a free world and work toward that. Others think the world of the future is so hard to predict there's no point in working toward a specific long-term goal, and we can make it up as we go along. There are two perspectives on achieving a world without oppressive institutions, where it's impossible for anyone to simply enter a system or acquire some resources and then go out and enslave people. That world is a long way away, but it's worth fighting for. There are many philosophies of liberation. In fact, if philosophy isn't ultimately about liberation, particularly of the mind, I'm not interested. In this video, we'll learn about anarcho-nihilism. Most people, like me until recently, don't know what to make of nihilism. Doesn't it mean you believe in nothing? Eh, not really. I put anarcho there because nihilism means a variety of things in philosophy, but all of them reject big ideas that are supposedly integral to the human experience like values, morals, and gods. To see what makes political or anarchist nihilism different, let's read Blessed is the Flame. The anarcho-nihilist position is essentially that we're fucked. That the current manifestation of human society civilization, leviathan, industrial society, global capitalism, whatever, is beyond salvation. And so our response to it should be one of unmitigated hostility. There are no demands to be made, no utopic visions to be upheld, no political programs to be followed. The path of resistance is one of pure negation. In short, that conditions in the social organization are so bad as to make destruction desirable for its own sake independent of any constructive program or possibility. This thoroughly inspiring book is about resistance in Nazi concentration camps. It's about acts of resistance not as a means of liberation, but as acts of liberation in themselves. I'd rather not select from the stories, but let you read it yourself. So, as, as always, there are links in the description. When things looked their darkest, people still fought back. When resisting, we temporarily forget to fear pain and death, and live in the joy of the moment of getting back at our oppressors. Liberation in these moments was not necessarily a material gain, but a fleeting lived experience, an existential reorientation from a relationship of domination to one of recalcitrance, pure jouissance or joy. Some of these attacks resonated widely outside their perimeter and punctured holes in the Nazi facade of invulnerability, perhaps even inspiring others to fight back. 
Other attacks simply dissipated in a hail of gunfire. Regardless, each of them seemed to defy any notion of hope or strategy, and the very fact that each story ends with a mass slaughter gestures towards a spirit of resistance that prioritized lived revolt over futurity. Nihilism is about negation. Negation is the unmitigated hostility, we just read about, toward the values and ideologies we've been taught to believe in, like authority, democracy, the rule of law, all the institutions of the white supremacist imperialist patriarchy. From Renzo Novatore. I am an individualist because I am an anarchist, and I am an anarchist because I'm a nihilist. But I also understand nihilism in my own way. I don't care whether it's Nordic or Oriental, nor whether or not it has a historical, political, practical tradition, or a theoretical, philosophical, spiritual, intellectual one. I call myself a nihilist because I know that nihilism means negation. Negation of every society, of every cult, of every rule, and of every religion. But I don't yearn for nirvana any more than I long for Schopenhauer's desperate and powerless pessimism, which is a worse thing than the violent renunciation of life itself. Mine is an enthusiastic and Dionysian pessimism, like a flame that sets my vital exuberance ablaze, that mocks at any theoretical, scientific, or moral prison. And if I call myself an individualist anarchist, an iconoclast, and a nihilist, it's precisely because I believe that in these adjectives there is the highest and most complete expression of my willful and reckless individuality that, like an overflowing river, wants to expand, impetuously sweeping away dikes and hedges until it crashes into a granite boulder, shattering and breaking up in its turn. I do not renounce life, I exalt and sing it. Nihilism means annihilating all oppressive institutions, including those in the mind. From Boom, Introductory Writings on Nihilism, also in the description. Some anarchists believed in what's called the propaganda of the deed, attempting to assassinate powerful people in the belief it would inspire more people to rise up. Nihilists thought assassination of the powerful was an end in itself. It negates their authority, disrupts their business, and terrifies their contemporaries. What's not to like? What nihilism provides, then, is an alternative to the alternative that does not embed an idealist image of the new world it would create. Another difference between nihilism and anarcho-communism seems to be the focus. While communists know you need to destroy something to achieve freedom, they also do a lot of building, because they're trying to build a future, building the new society in the shell of the old, right? A lot of communists think of liberation as a series of stages that you can identify from reading the lessons of history. That leads some of them to dream of a future of full communism, where there's no state, no prisons, no police, no money, just people organizing freely to get things done. Nihilists, on the other hand, tend to focus on the here and now, not only on resisting their enemies, but on the joy of that moment. When you read stories about nihilists, you can't help but marvel. Story after story of people resisting despite apparently overwhelming odds. Taking brazen measures to kill the worst oppressors. Oh, but that's not what you should do. Assassination is illegal. But what could you do to resist? Well, again, your actions should flow from your analysis. Who are your oppressors? Where are the centers of power? How can you stop them, even if just temporarily? If you want to understand political economic systems, along with all the other ways I've explained them on this channel, you might think in terms of processes. Everything the state does, everything the corporation does, all oppressive institutions, they have processes. We should disrupt those processes. Think about what's supposed to happen and stop it. Money is supposed to flow from the consumer to the corporation. Smashing the corporation's windows shuts it down temporarily. The process can't continue. Looting the store reduces profit margins. The less money someone or something has, the less influence it has. What else is supposed to happen? Police are supposed to arrest people, keep them in prison, extort them for money, etc. 
de-arresting people, breaking them out, or even just wasting the police's time disrupts their work. I'm sure if their highest priority really is catching the most violent and dangerous people, they'll still have time to do it. People get kicked out of their homes because they don't have the money. If you band with them, you can interrupt that normal daily process. Some people make decisions to pollute or destroy land every day. If you were to, say, stop them from getting to work, they couldn't make those decisions. If the office was on fire, it would be highly inconvenient. Perhaps some of the work, some of the processes could continue, but not as efficiently. So when I talk about destruction, I don't necessarily mean destroying physical infrastructure. After all, that would be illegal. Sure, the ideal is to replace all hierarchical power that makes us dependent on it with horizontally organized people taking care of each other. But we're a long way from that ideal. There are no means currently available to us to permanently shut down all these processes because as long as systems of power exist, they will attempt to return to the status quo. But agitating and disrupting is something you can do today. Do you think the people in Iran need a plan for what to do after they take down the government? Or is resistance itself where they find freedom? The fact is, we have the power to disrupt the system. With time, we can even eliminate it. It takes organization, commitment, and guts. Oh, and guns! Thanks.